My name is Scott Chaloner and this is the Leaders' Council podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. And despite it being another gloomy winter day here in the capital, I'm delighted to say that we've got the chairman of GQA Qualifications, Mike Morris, joining us on the show to help bat away those January blues. Uh, Mike, welcome and thank you for coming on to the programme. You're very welcome. Um, now, GQA Qualifications, Mike, um, your um, organisation, um, just to sort of expand on what you do that a little bit more for those tuning in, uh, you're a national awarding body based in Sheffield that works across a, ro- a wide range of industries. And the reason why we're coming into this conversation with such positivity is that you were incorporated in 2002 and therefore we're in 2022 now to 20th year in business. So quite the major milestone. Yes, it is. Um, it's uh, quite a staggering story of success, really. Um, we started in the 90s, actually, with uh, as a division of GTL, GTL, which is Glass Trading Limited, which was the lead body for the glass sector, glass mm. trading sector. Um, and in the late 90s, they realised that they had to set up a separate function for accreditation of qualifications from training, because they provided training as well. So they set up you know, the Glass Qualifications Authority, as it, was, as it was called then, in the late 90s. And I joined the board then as a director. Um, and it was still a division of GQA, of uh, GTL, but it was a separate account service. And then we realised that wasn't going to be sufficient for the regulators. So we set up a new company in 2002, um, of which I was one of the original board members. Um, and I became chair about a year later. Um, so and I've been chairman ever since. So yes, we started off in, embedded in the in the glass sector with a, a forty thousand pound loan from GCL, um, and that was it really. And the idea was never to make much profit. It was just to make sure that there was a ready stream of qualifications available to support the industry, which we we, we did over the years. But uh, due to some good sort of husbandry by the CEO at the time, Alan Murray. Um, we very quickly turned in, into a profitable organisation, paid the loan off, mm. and started to uh, expand a little bit. And, and that was good. We had some steady years, uh, got involved with standard setting, got involved with all sorts of things, um, and have grown every year ever since. We haven't had a bad year, really, um, until we've got our new chief exec now. I say new, so after about 15 years at Nick Clayton who leads it very well on the front. And it's uh, a very stable staff. We have very, very little staff turnover, um, all dedicated people. So it's still very, very happy with it. The thing I must say about it, though, is it's, 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 although it's a private company, it's, um, there's no shareholders. There's no um, dividends to pay. Any profits that we make, any surpluses, go back into the organisation mm. or are invested in the sectors that we work in. Um, in order to support and promote training, qualifications, and accreditation, and so on. So the board members, including myself, all work as volunteers. Uh, we don't take anything out of it, and we're not allowed to actually. Any profits have to go back into the sector. So it's it, that's part of the reason why it's been successful, um, because it's, it is led altruistically by the board, and they want to see the best for the sectors that they they, they represent. So I'm going to do a bit mm. of introduction to it. Yeah, certainly. And um, just because as well, a lot of our sort of regular and young listeners that might be tuning into this, Mike, are of the sort of entrepreneurial mindset themselves and might even be thinking of starting a business of their own. Um, it is helpful to sort of get an idea of um, obviously why you're successful like that, because you are prudent and all money is reinvested back into the business. And in those early days, I suppose with cash being king as it is, it's so often that you know, you have to prioritise things like that. And it's good to sort of take that on board in the very early days of building up your business or your organisation, isn't it? Yeah, we've always been really strong on uh, budgetary control. Well, it had to be at the start. Um, and it was helpful to know that we had some strong industry backers. We had um, GTL was still in existence then, and we had very strong links with them. So if we did have a bad year, we knew that we could go back to this sort of parents' organisation uh, if we needed to. So it wasn't it wasn't as risky a, a venture as perhaps definitely your own business in, 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 your, in your bedroom uh, because we have these fairly strong backers if we needed them. Mm. Yeah, fortunately, we didn't, but it did give us the confidence to take staff on and, and make those sorts of decisions to 
sort of uh, our employment costs in the first year were, I don't know, maybe hundred thousand pounds. We had forty thousand pounds in the bank at the start, so it's that's the sort of risk that you, you you take at the start, and you think we'll have enough money coming in to pay it. And you're right, the first year or two, cash is king. You've got to have it's cash flow you need. You've got to have cash in the bank. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, and it, our, our growth has been very slow at the start, steady but slow for probably ten years. It's probably in the last five years that it's gone through the roof. Um, so uh, it's um, yeah, it's, it's you know patience. There's no instant success with this sort of business. Hmm. It's uh, you know slowly, slowly catching monkey sort of thing. Exactly right. And I suppose in terms of that sort of journey of taking the business forward, I imagine it was sort of quite an easy decision to sort of diversify your qualification offering. You mentioned already that you originally set up for the glass industry to you know, provide robust qualifications to drive up standards in that sector. And then when you realise well, we're actually good at this, it's quite easy to sort of branch out, isn't it? Yeah, well, that, that, that's right. I mean, we were originally purposed for the, the glass and grazing sector, um, but um, you may or may not be aware of the introduction of the Tech Skills Council that replaced a lot of these sort of uh, industry bodies mm. uh, from years, from sort of 20 odd years ago now. And we end up with the Tech Skills Council, the SSCs. And there were some big ones that are well known in sort of construction and engineering. But in the glass sector, the, there wasn't one. Uh, and there were a number of other sort of disparate sectors, too small to have their own Tech Skills Council. So they formed one called um, Pro Skills, which was a sort of umbrella set skills council for glass, glazing, print, coatings, uh, and a few other uh, different sectors. And they all came together under this. And the idea of the set skills council was to provide occupational standards for the sectors so that people could measure competence against them, employers could be assured of the competence of the staff and all the rest of it. Um, unfortunately, Pro Skills disbanded after a few years and it left. It meant that there was nobody, no sector lead for any of these uh, uh, sectors. Um, so, and there was no awarding body really for the other sectors. So we ended up picking up all the pro skill sectors uh, as a way of providing the same sort of service to them as the grass sector got. So we worked with uh, pro skills before they disbanded to, to do that and uh, have really been picked up those ever since. I mean, more recently, we acquired another awarding body, um, which was like G2A, fairly small by comparison to the, the bigger ones, uh, but worked in a lot of different specialist sectors. So we now include, we've got about 18 or 19 different sectors we work in, and they include obviously the glass, glazing, penetration, construction that we've always done, but there's some engineering in there, there's the nuclear mm. lab stuff, there's meteorology, that's the weather forecasting stuff. Um, we've even now just developed uh, a, a new award for scouts and scouting, uh, which the Scouting Association is taking forward nationally. So that's, that's quite exciting for us as well. It's completely mm. different uh, for us, but it's uh, the same sort of principles of monitoring the quality, making sure the standards are upheld and uh, and so on, uh, with, you know, with robustly and with integrity, so that the end users can be sure that the qualification they've got is actually meaningful and useful. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a bit of a roller coaster sometimes, but we've, we, we're there now and we're, we see a, a good surplus each year. And we've, our biggest problem now is what to invest it into. How do we invest this money to get, get the maximum impact on the sector we want to work with? Yeah, exactly, of course. And just going back sort of a, a few years, just because you did mention um, the fenestration um, being an industry you were involved in, um, I understand around 10 or 11 years ago, um, you played quite a big role in the development of minimal technical competencies for fenestration. And that obviously came as a big milestone for the business, but it also brought one or two challenges because when it came to raising standards within that sector, a lot of businesses tend to only access qualifications if they're told to do so by regulatory bodies, by governments. They don't sort of go and do that voluntarily, do they? So that was a challenge, I suppose, that you sort of had to try and find a way around. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that we've succeeded with that as yet either. We're, we're still on with that. And it, if there is one thing I could change in the way that the whole qualification competence sector works, this would be it. Um, what happened was they set up a, a team of people to develop the minimum technical competences that are required by fenestration operatives. 
Um, and these are the, I mean, you to compare these to somebody like, somebody, a gas fitter putting in a boiler or an electrician wiring up your house. They, they sort of what the minimum standards you want these people to have to, be, to work safely in a property. Um, and to make, make a sort of list of these and make sure that the people who are employed to do this, to do these jobs, uh, can at least reach these minimum standards, and it was so that, that that's part of the, the the government's role. I think is to try to help regu- help sectors regulate themselves so that they've, they've got competent people. I mean, if you cast your mind back to, to Grenfell and what wow. happened there, had we had much stronger regulation in place at the time, that could never have happened. But nevertheless, sadly, it did. And what we want to do is to get the sector better regulated. And we believe the minimum technical competencies, welcome as, as they are, are the very, very first little step on the ladder towards competence. They pretty much assure the employer that the person is reasonably safe to be in the workplace and isn't really dangerous to it, him or herself or the people around. They don't really ha- offer any assurance to the customer that the person's competent in doing the job. Um, they're just there really to make sure the person's safe and that the people around them are going to be safe when they do the job. Um, it, it's a, a very short course. It's a, it's a kind of a knowledge-based exam. There's no practical in it. It's, it, it, it's, it's well, I would describe it as being very lightweight. It's a, it, the word minimum should be written in very big letters. Uh, it, it, it's no more than that. And what we would like to do is to Take that, use that as the first step, and then look at the other competences that people need uh, in order to become a, a, a properly qualified, well trained installer or fabricator or surveyor, whatever it is in the industry that they're doing. Um, and the, the qualifications that we offer to do that, they uh, were based on the national occupational standards that are still in existence. They're not, it, it's not even used in England at the moment, um, but in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, where we do work. They are used, uh, and the qualifications in those nations are based on the National Occupational Standards. Uh, GQA has actually been involved in writing some of them, based on the standards, uh, working with the Scottish government to do that uh, in the last few years. So they do exist, but in England, qualifications no longer have to follow the occupational standards. So um, it, that's a worry to us. Um, we think we're at a time now where we ought to be define what competence these installers, these fitters, surveyors have and have a means to check that they actually meet those. Not that they all, all not that they just meet the, the very, very basic requirements to get on site. They, they need to be able to prove they can do the job as well. And we think this is in the interest of the industry. And you, you're right mm. in what you say. A lot of employers are really interested in qualifications unless they, they're either forced to or they do benefit. And we, our, our task on this is to try and promote the benefits of qualifications to employers. And we find we have no difficulty in doing this whatsoever to the larger, more successful employers. They, they readily accept these and promote them and work with them because they can see the impact it has on their business. They see it as being an investment rather than a cost. You know, training your staff, get them to achieve accredited qualifications is a real investment and it, it, the human aspect in the, in, in the company really um, is enhanced by doing this and it ends up with their reputation of the company is enhanced, their, the defects and the repairs and the you know, contractual issues disappear because jobs are done properly right first time and all the rest um, and ultimately the costs come down uh, and they keep the staff because the staff uh, believe in that this company cares about them, so it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, and we see that, that that's the, the way forward, really. There's a, a, an example we've got in working with a, a company in the food processing sector called British Sugar, um, which is a massive company and is really almost got a monopoly in the UK. But they realised a while back in 2012, I think it was, that they needed to assure themselves of the competence of their workforce. And there were no qualifications available in sugar beet processing and all the rest of it. So they worked with uh, an awarding body to develop technical competence-based 
qualifications to cover the their operations. And this is this was done by the company that we merged with uh, some time ago. So we've acquired all that, and we're still working with British Shipping now. And they mm. are really, really keen on qualifications. And I was talking to the um, their head of quality and safety uh, compliance and head of training uh, last week. And one of the, just, I just wrote me a note, a quote that he said uh, was this, having a de facto standard as knowledge and competence defined, measured and standardized across our business uh, has given us consistent achievement to trainees. Uh, and he, he went on to say it's had a positive impact on the, the business in terms financially and it's, this is a real investment and it's something to carry forward. So we still get we still get registration through from British Shipping now. But that's because it's a big company, they can afford a trading manager, they can afford mm. to invest in this and they can measure the impact. If you're a small installer where you've only got yourself and one other person, are you going to be able to afford the, the time to train yourself or to train this other person to uh, the, the correct standard? And it's so it, increasingly small businesses like that, uh, they just do the bare minimum they can get away with because they, they, they just worry about cash for the next job. So uh, it, unless there is some form of regulation, those businesses may not choose to go down this route. And the, the sad thing is the most vociferous part of the sector uh, represents very small companies like these who've got no real interest in training or qualification. They just want the minimum they need to get on the site, do the job and, and get off and never be heard of again. Um, so the, the problem with that is that you've got no comeback in late, late days. If something goes wrong, mm-hmm. you're in this call out. So you're going to go to this company's long since gone. And the more regulation we have, the fewer cowboys you get in the sector. I'm not saying that all the stallers are bad. It's certainly not the case. The, you know, the vast majority of them are, do, are really experienced. They know what they're doing. They do a good job. But there is no requirement for a window fitter to have any qualifications or training in, in England at the moment. Anybody could come along and fit your windows and, and do any sort of job. And there's no comeback, really. They don't have to be trained. There's no regulation supporting them. And that's, that's the, the issue for us, really. We, we would like it to be in the same footing as GAF or Electric, where the, the fitters, the installers, are registered. Uh, as, as, you know, and to be on the register, they're going to be trained. They're going to have updates. They're going to have... Uh, training each year or every few years. Um, they've got to leave contact details. They've got to say where they source the products from and all the rest of it. There's a whole list of things you could put in there. And the end user would be far happier uh, with that sort of approach, uh, we, we believe. Um, there should be then be fewer bad installations. We work with a lot of the big systems houses that make the, the big uh, sliding doors, mm. window systems and so on. They are all uh, are signed up to a high quality uh, installation, and they would like to see people trained. Mm. Unfortunately, they, it's difficult to train your customers. Um, in, in other industries, I've done personally a lot of work for the automotive sector, and they, they're the other way around. The, the car manufacturer, the really car assemblers, uh, assemble parts and made further down the supply chain, and they because they are the customer to these suppliers. They demand quality systems are put in place so that all their suppliers work to quality systems, their staff are trained and all the rest of it. So that when they get the parts, they're the highest possible quality and they can produce a car that's of the highest quality, uh, quality that, you can, that you can imagine. With glass and glaze, it's the other way around. The big companies, the Pilkington, Sengaban, the, the big systems people like Shivko and, and others who make real, they've made real strides to become really high quality. They are, the quality in, in these businesses is so high and they've worked for years in, on, on improving it. And the trouble is if you, if you then give that to a cowboy who installed it badly, uh, their products get a bad name. And it, it, so the, how, how do you actually engineer quality downstream after, after the products left your, your factory? Um, and so it, in, it's in the interest of all these larger companies to drive the qualifications and training in the sector upwards. Um, but it's, it's not easy for them to do that because uh, at the end of the day, they want to sell the, the product. So it's, it's a bit of catch-22, isn't it? 
It is, isn't it? But I think you're absolutely right in what you're saying there, that working toward qualifications and encouraging learning opportunities, it's, it's going to be important if um, the entire industry is to continue to improve and set the highest standards because it can help sort of make the sector more appealing to young people looking for a career after education if there is that sort of, you know, that learning opportunity, that clear progression there. And that's going to be key to sort of helping address that long-standing skills gap that's been so prevalent in construction, especially for so many years, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, there's other things we could do. I did hint before that we, we our biggest problem is trying to work out what to invest in. Well, the investment we made just before the lockdown was, um, we made two big investments. One is in an organisation called Building Our Skills, which is a sort of uh, a representative body for the glass and glazing sector to try and encourage young people to consider it as a career. Um, so there's a lot of, sort of PR in that, working with schools, working with um, career advisors and so on, for, for producing materials and resources for them to use. And so Building Our Skills is a separate company uh, not for profit. We might make it a charity, uh, but it's certainly one step removed from GQA. But their role is to actually promote glass and glazing fenestration as a career to people, um, and and so on. Get uh, ambassadors from other countries going to different schools and things. We've got plans for it, but it's not obviously the COVID restrictions have impacted on that that development. But it, it is going strong, and it's um, at the moment it's fully funded by GQA, but. We want it to be self-standing after a while. So we've still pump primed it, but the idea is that he, he gets sponsorship and so on from, from other organisations. It's also got a training arm, which is a separate company. And we've uh, set up some training premises in Sheffield that actually your leader, Lord Blunkett, opened in 2020. He mm. uh, came up and op- opened the uh, resources, the, the facilities, um, which is kind of him. And that's that has been built and finished. It's the only sort of training centre for glass and glazing specialists in in Sheffield, and people come from quite a, a wide area. But we're conscious that, that we've got uh, gaps in provision across the country. So we all, we've also set up another uh, fund to provide grants to training centres who want to um, develop specific specialist glass uh, training facilities. Uh, on their premises, and we've made uh, at the moment it's the grant level is five thousand pounds per company, and if they want to, and that's based on we, we've, the pods that we've created to train on cost about five thousand pounds to do. So if they're providing the, the accommodation, we'll provide the uh, resources to enable to set up some training pods for uh, administration. And we've had a few a few of these have gone already. Some in uh, sort of Cornwall area. There's one in the south. Uh, southeast, I think. We're looking at one in Scotland at the moment, and there's some what was worth looking somewhere in the, the northeast. So it's that, that's a, a positive outcome for us. We I think we allocated about hundred thousand pounds altogether for this particular project to, to get off. So we've not spent anything like all of it yet, but we that's the sort of thing that we would get involved in in providing, in, you know, making it possible for organisations to actually do specialist training. Um, I used to work in a college. Um, and we had no glass or glazing uh, equipment or space to train people in that at the college. And it was really hard to argue that we, we ought to develop some, something around uh, double glazing and uh, fenestration and that sort of thing. Uh, because there wasn't space. The space was used up for carpenters, for bricklayers, for, for the, the main trades like that. Um, and, and so, so it's hard to develop specific specialists administration training resources um, so we've, we've, we've done that we've got a mechanism for that now when we're helping these organizations to develop the physical resources what we then needed was a range of course materials for them to use and there's a, a brand called profiter uh, that has been doing this for quite a few years and has been really successful mm. in providing specialist training at a high level uh, linked in with certain companies and so on but we we bought this brand and the only resources uh, last year and now we are operating well building our skills has bought them has, has been, has, has, is operating them to run the courses on these premises and sites we've got involved with so not only we've we got providing the physical resources we're also providing the, the learning resources the, the lecture notes the assessment materials the 
uh, you know, the workbooks, all, all the rest of it is, is out there as well. So we, we, we're doing a, whatever we can to try and promote this. And the idea in, in this, what, what's in it for GQA, why do we do this? We want the sector to be successful, but we also want people to move towards qualification. And if they have decent training and they realise that once they've completed these courses, they've done the first half or the first three quarters of the qualification, um, or the practical elements of it, which are the hard bits to get, then they may well go on to complete the full qualification. So it's really it's to try and drive business towards our core area, getting the whole workforce qualified. Because um, there's a difference between being trained and being qualified. And it's, I think it's uh, important that people are, have the skills and the knowledge recognised with a, a proper qualification. Mm. Um, but, yeah, just a, a few things we've been, been on with to try and in, increase mm. the attractiveness of the sector to younger people, to parents, to uh, to everybody, really. Because it's, as with every other sector in the country at the minute, it seems, that every short of uh, staff, uh, and graphic players and administration is no exception. Um, the, it's the lack of trained staff that's the problem. It is, absolutely. And I suppose that growing sort of network and pool of resources that GQA has got at its disposal, it is playing a real part in upskilling the population and improving people's lives. Because since um, 2002, you've issued over 142,000 individual qualifications, and that was as of last year. So it's probably even more than that now. And um, within those qualifications as well, um, you mentioned earlier on that you've even branched out as far as offering qualifications for scouts, which is quite incredible. But um, another project that you're also involved with Mike from Wright and saying is rehabilitation support for criminal offenders, which has enjoyed a good uptake as they try to sort of move out of prison and then into stable employment. Yeah, this this is a, a sort of organic growth thing. This really, we we got involved with one. I can't remember the details now. There's a paper went to our board recently that uh, gives the full details of it. It was really an interesting read. Uh, it. We started off with one uh, institution and it was really giving the inmates some skills and knowledge about this, about these types of jobs so that when they came out, instead of being an employee, they could walk straight into a job that uh, they were trained for. And it, it is something you can do in a, in a confined um, environment so it suits prison life quite well, really. Um, and it got picked up by the prison service and the, he got replicated in quite a few other prisons up and down the country. So, it, yeah, that, that, that's taken quite well, that really. Um, other people in GQA can give you far more details than I can, but it's, uh, it is a success story. And it's, it's to do with the people within GQA are, are brilliant. They're, they're so committed and uh, loyal to the company. Um, and as I say, they're fairly stable. The, the people join GQA but don't leave. Um, so... And they, they sort of gradually absorb the culture and the values of the organisation, which is to promote training at every opportunity. And that that happened quite by chance, really. And it's just because the people that are so enthusiastic, uh, the GQA staff in, in supporting them, they made it easy for the prison service to develop the, the provision. And it, it just spread across. And that's, that's what's happened in quite a few different sectors. Um, and scouting is this case in point. I mean, the... I couldn't understand as a board member how on earth we got involved in scouting. It was just a uh, one-off remark by somebody. The scouting badges are really statements of competence, um, and that's really what the units are in our qualifications, statements of competence. So it, it, will, it wasn't really much of a – so it was also windscreen. The guy was called Chris Bonsall. Mm. It was also windscreen. Um, Chris Bonds, when he retired from auto windscreens uh, and was working with the scout movement, realised that the badges that they had matched very closely to statement of competence. But they were, they were assessed and delivered differently across each troop across the country, so there was no real consistency. So what they did was to write a set of standards to try and bring them all in line, and he recognised that this was a, a qualification in the waiting. So he got involved with our team who we knew anyway up for his years in the glass sector in auto windscreen and they worked with them enthusiastically and developed the two new diplomas um, and uh, it's this, the this success story really it's um, it, what he said was that auto windscreen and our customers were the private or large organisations so our city staff were trained and qualified to MVP standards it gave them confidence in the service we're about to deliver so as a business they understood that so they developed and maintained MVQs across their whole business 
And when you went to the, the scout, you realised that's what they needed to. So uh, just developed it in, in line with that. It's exactly, exactly the same principle, exactly the same sort of quality checks on accreditation, the same uh, way to uh, record evidence and so on. So that's been uh, a real success story. And it is, and I would say, it's a sort of organic way to develop qualifications, but it's, it's the people in the organisations that we work with and the people in G2A who make these things happen, and it's all credit to them, really. Yeah, exactly right. And I can imagine that they've really sort of brought the best out in themselves, particularly over the last couple of years with the challenge that we've all had to face with the COVID-19 situation, of course. Um, We've obviously avoided talking about the pandemic up until this point, but I think it would be remiss if we didn't touch on that. Um, How sort of operationally has it been for yourselves sort of getting over that challenge over the last couple of years? Yeah, it's um, it's been a bit of a struggle. I've put a few notes on this. Um, when it first occurred, we had a board meeting in November, I think, of 2019. And I actually, I think I raised it and said, we've got this COVID thing coming in. I think we call it coronavirus then. Um, and do we need to do anything about it? How bad is it going to be? And there were various concerns about it. So I, we, the chief exec, we, we actually talked to him about it and we, created a budget for our, for the following year, for 2020, uh, where the, we assumed in the first three months from April to June there'd be zero income coming to the company. And we cut our costs accordingly to assume there's no income coming what do we have to do to stay slow and so on. So that's, that's how we sort of approached it at the start, thinking that three, it would, after three months in 2020, it's bound to have finished by then, we'll be back to normal. Uh, how wrong were we on that? But anyway, we, we cracked on like that. And when we realised that we had to shut the office down and people had to work at home, we just worked, we just, just worked through it. We uh, bought laptop, laptops for the office staff um, who work from home. Um, we opened the office one or two days a week to print certificates off and get them in the post and things that we couldn't do from home. But only one person was in the office then. So we did that really safely. Uh, none of the staff got COVID during that time at all. Um, and things just had, so with the actual day to day running of the business just carried on as normal. The problem we had was obviously there were going to be fewer registrations and qualifications out there in the sector if everybody was sat at home. So um, we were a little bit wrong on that. The worst registrations continued because a few years before, um, one of Nick Clayton's first roles as he joined GQA was to develop online learning with us. And uh, e assessment and e portfolios and that sort of thing. So, by, by the time uh, 2020 arrived, all that has been in place, and all our centres and staff are very au okay fait with it. They, they use that for day to day go to means of uh, administering the business of GQA anyway. So, it was very easy to move to a, uh, an online business really um, during that period. Um, and it, it helped our centre as well. He could still process qualifications and apply certificates and that sort of thing, register people uh, throughout all that time. So we didn't really miss a beat. We did have a very quiet month in April uh, and May, I think it was. We were quiet, but they weren't zero. And as the pandemic wore on, um, it really, what happened was the registrations that would have come through them came through later. So we, in the end, had a, a really successful year because we didn't assume much income. Uh, we had to rebudget to forecast the hiring him mm-hmm. at the year end. So it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was well managed and uh, hasn't really affected the business. We've, we've, we grew, did more business this last year than we did the year before, and and it's been through growth each year. So we've been uh, very lucky. Um, from where we started, you know, we've, we've, uh, I've did some research recently into the organization and realized that until 2018 we delivered a third of all the qualifications we ever delivered and since 2018 we've delivered two-thirds of the total number of qualifications so we've actually done more in the last three years than we did in the previous 17 or 18 which is so staggering yeah. an indication of the growth i mean look the total qual delivered uh, already done so far is just short of 200,000 um, that we've we've done. So it's, it's you know it's nothing like as big as 
some of the three big awarding bodies, but it's uh, obviously one of the millions, but it's, it's significant. You know, the number of people who walk around with decoy qualifications now is, 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 is quite significant, I think. It is, isn't it? And I can imagine that there's been some benefit from the fact that we've seen some industries such as the hospitality sector really stricken by the pandemic and there's been an exodus of staff from sectors like that who are willing to go and sort of upskill and move into new industries so for sort of qualifications providers such as yourselves i mean i can imagine it has been and probably continues to be quite an interesting time yeah yeah i mean probably a bigger impact on g quite than brexit i would think because that's taking quite a lot of the workforce out um, we used to get uh, large numbers of Eastern Europeans trying to register the qualifications and uh, skills cards and things, and that's that's gone down a lot since then. So there's there's a few people coming through that route than, than there was. So we've noticed that. Um, but yeah, it's the the COVID uh, still hasn't had anything like the impact on us. That was sort of it had a, a bigger impact on everyday life and getting into the office mm. and that sort of thing, but it's in terms of the actual business it's not really affected too badly yeah that's really really positive to hear and um when it came to sort of you know mobilizing everybody to sort of maintain that sort of productivity did you find that it was easy in house to sort of maintain morale amongst sort of your staff colleagues especially particularly in the early days of covid because i can imagine that that might have been a challenge somewhere along the line yeah well it's it's the the company's got two parts to it there's a technical team who get involved with the quality assurance out in the centres, uh, around the place, develop new qualifications, new products, that sort of thing. And they're out virtually four days a week anyway. They're only in the office once a week or once a fortnight, something like that. Because they're moving around the country, with the country so in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, as well as England. And they cover the whole country. So um, they're not always, it's very, very easy for them to work at home. They're quite used to working away from the office. But the, the administration team, the finance team, they're office-based and always have been. And have a really good rapport with each other, but um, it was really it was harder for them to not see each other for several months. That was difficult for them. And not all of them had the whole offices set up and that sort of thing. So it, was, it wasn't easy for them, but, uh, but we, we got through it. And uh, with all the staff that were there with us then are still with us now. So they're all back in the office now. Um, We've moved things around a bit so they're a bit more distance. And they'd rather be in the office than at home, but could give them the opportunity to do either. But uh, we're going to take a decision in the next week or two whether to close it again or not. But uh, at the moment, it's, it's still open and they're all fine. So um, hopefully that should continue. Yeah, I suppose as much as we talk about sort of the benefits of working from home and hybrid working models, I think it is important that the office environment will always play a part in the future because I think we are social creatures as human beings, aren't we? And we do sort of rely on that human contact. And I think if you don't sort of have a common office environment or any kind of environment where you all come together in person, you sometimes sort of miss those kind of water cooler moments, let's say, which really help sort of drive innovation forward as well. So that is important for employers certainly moving forward to consider over the next few months and indeed years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things, GQA is well known for it is being responsive. And when centres and candidates ring up, there's always somebody they'll talk to them and sort them out, work out what the problem is, spend time on the phone. And so that we've we lost a little bit of that at first. But I think even that's been sorted now. There's cyber phones and things to to organise that. So yeah, and you're, it is that camaraderie, it is that shared sense of purpose that, 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 that you can lose. But as I say, the the team is very small, very close to each other, and they do talk to each other on the phone. So it's, it's, it, we haven't lost that too, too much. I mean, we've not had a, uh, a we usually have a, some sort of Christmas do or a, something like that, but we've, we've not been able to do that this year or last year. So, uh, but uh, that's a shame because we usually you know, get the board involved and have a, a sort of meal together or something like that. Um, in 19, 2019, we went, we had a, a, a development day at the Shard in London and. Um, we took the whole team there and we went uh, up the Shard, had a, a look at this massive glass project and just really to give people a sense of what the glass industry does. Um, it's not just double glazing and windows, it does massive construction as, as, as well. So it's, that, was, that was really quite a nice thing to do. 
Uh, but we've not obviously been able to do anything like that uh, for a couple of years. But it's um, something we'll do again, something like that, to, to try and, and, and you know engender that sense of that shared sense of purpose and that uh, sort of shared cultural values and so on. Um, so I think they're really useful there those, those days. Yeah, and instilling that sort of like unity, that togetherness, that culture is so so important in any business, really, isn't it? And uh, I think we've really learned the value of that over the year, the last couple of years, because those businesses that have had that togetherness in house, I mean, you find that your workforce is more inclined when the chips are down to really go above and beyond for you as well. So um, we've seen the impact of that. And we're seeing now that the demands that prospective employees have of their prospective employers are starting to change. They're wanting to know about whether they have flexibility. They're wanting to know what company culture is centered on. Is it on well-being? Is it on togetherness or is it something else? And if you're not prioritizing these things in these changing times, you know, you're not just going to be, you're just not going to be able to sort of tap into that pool of talent that's out there. And it's a tough environment for recruitment at the moment. It's fair to say. We're carrying some vacancies at the moment. We've been trying to fill for a while. Um, sort of team. So yeah, it's uh, it is it is tough in terms of recruitment. Um, and yeah, we did, yeah, we have taken apprentices in the past, um, and they're still here with us now. <laughs> so um, we yeah we we are, we do need some more support, more of the technical teams, some more of the admin team as well. Um, but the people involved have been. So we look at CVs every week um, for these people. So, yeah, it's a, it is a recruitment a tough time at the moment. And if we reflect sort of on the last couple of years, by and large, and the challenges that we've overcome during COVID to date, would you say that there are any sort of positive lessons that you, you'll you maybe take forward within the business, having sort of learned from this period of crisis management, if we call it that? Yeah, I, I think one of the things is horizon spotted. When we saw COVID coming, uh, as soon as we possibly could do, and immediately took steps to mitigate its impact. And that was that was useful. Uh, having the budget set up already to assume that we our income would be low, there was no there were no surprises, no shocks. Having the invested in the GQA line some years back was, you know, coincidentally helped us massively. Without that, we would have had to shut down. I think, um, and having staff who you can trust. Uh, it, it was a major thing because a, a lot of employers think if people work from home, well, they just, they, just, they, they log on and that's it. it nothing happens. Uh, but our team aren't like that. They they would make sure they would do the, put the hours in and get the, the tasks done that they're assigned in the time that they've got. So, and they would trust on both sides that way. Um, it, the, the flexibility they had for work at home, people like, but they also miss each other in the office, so it's given the choice they'd rather be in the office. But it's not necessarily the organisation saying, get back in behind your desk. It's, it's the staff themselves want to be there. So it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's harder to send them home than it is to keep them in the office, really, mm-hmm. uh, I would say. So that's, that's good mm-hmm. stuff for you. Yeah, it's interesting times, isn't it, as far as working practices are concerned. And like you hear it talks about this new normal. We don't know exactly what form it's going to take, but I think sort of, those sorts of hybrid working patterns are certainly going to play a part in the long-term future of how we do business in the UK. And obviously after 20 years, I think it suffices that we talk about the next 20 years for GQA and obviously the immediate future. Um, what does the future hold for the business, would you say, uh, Mike? And what are some of your priorities yeah. going to be over the next 12 months? I I think that GQA will continue growing. Whether it can carry on growing the rate it's growing at the moment, I, I don't know. I don't think it can because it's, it's, uh, it would be uh, too fast a rate of growth, I think. But um, we we're currently, we do a five-year strategic plan and we're halfway through the, the current one now. It runs out in 25. But because things have changed so much, we've, we've just started a project on the sort of interim strategic review just to look at exactly where we're going. We've got these new sectors that have come on board as well. We don't know that much about. So we're doing some research into those and we want to develop our links with these new sectors so they're as strong as those that we have with glass. Um, and there's different ways into each of those, so we, we're following up on, on, on those. There's about 19 sectors, 18, 19 sectors, that we need to get involved with uh, at a, in, in a strategic and objective and structured way rather than just 
the organic sort of links that are created at the minute. We, we'd rather have a, a proper reporting system and, and so on. So that's, we, we used to work on that at the moment. Um, in 20 years' time, I think that we will have a workforce that is regulated. I think we'll have an apprenticeship scheme in glass, which doesn't exist at the moment in England. Uh, but I think that will be sorted. I think that um, people will look to the registration sector for solutions for the climate crisis that's going to hit us. Um, because fenestration systems in you, in combination with heating systems and cooling systems uh, provide a lot of the solutions to the uh, energy efficiency in, in domestic and commercial properties. Um, so I think window fitters, installers, um, system designers, they're going to be looking at uh, energy efficiency and ways in which you can enhance things like ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps and uh, under four heating and uh, recycled energy, all, all the rest of it. It, it. We will be looking at linking in with those and making it more of a, a coherent solution rather than just different industries come together. And I think that the staff, the employees in the glass sector will be doing training on uh, environmental issues you know, heat loss calculations, that sort of thing, more than they do now. Um, I think that the uh, each sector will have its own little quirky thing. For example, we do work with the nuclear sector at the moment, but I see in 20 years' time we might have a, a larger number of much smaller nuclear reactors around the place, each town having one, for example, rather than having a few big ones, um, which has a different... Uh, impact on qualifications and on staff training and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it, it's, this is part of the reason for the strategic review that we're doing in each of the sectors, just to talk to the sectors and find out where they see the future. Um, I think GQA will carry on. Um, we are at, at the mercy of regulators a lot of the time, uh, off quality in England, uh, SQA in uh, Scotland, qualification Wales and uh, SEA in Northern Ireland. And we do have to meet their requirements uh, and submit um, self assessments each year to them and we get audited by them and so on. So we are fairly heavily regulated um, by these organisations. So I am happy for that to happen and I, I hope that that continues to happen. Whether it will still be there in 20 years' time or not, I don't know. Mm. Um, but uh, we are at the mercy of government decisions. I think, mean, particularly regulations. Whatever comes out of the Grenfell inquiry, whatever comes out of um, the climate COP26 uh, issues. So I think regulations will come for developers, for builders, for installers, uh, from all of those. And they'll affect a lot of the sectors we work with um, to a lesser or, or greater extent. And we'll be we're looking at these now and thinking, what do we need to put in place to make sure that we're ready to support them? Um, uh, I mean, it was reading up on the, the print industry today. That's one of the sectors that we work with. Um, they are obviously heavily involved in um, recycling things and, uh, and and so on. So that, that's another area of, of development for us. We need to look at what we're, we're going to do that in the future. Well, Spagard Rates are learned to say that the print industry is the fifth biggest in the country. The fifth biggest sector in the country. I didn't know that. Um, mm. But it's, we do all the qualifications for the print sector. So it's, um, yeah, we've, we've got quite a few um, irons in the fire at the minute. And it's, uh, at the end of the day, what we like to see in 20 years' time is a really competent workforce, really well-qualified workforce, um, doing really good jobs in sectors that are well-respected by end users and by employers and by government and so on. Um, and I, so really, that's part of our strategic direction is to, work towards that, work towards being uh, making things better through qualifications for all concerns, really. If there are a lot of the problems we're facing, we will face, qualifications are going to become the answer or part of the answer. Mm. And it's important for us to be able to respond to that. 
Exactly right, because I do believe yeah, you're very right in what you're saying. Qualifications are going to have a huge role to play. And like I say, we're going to be embracing these huge challenges of the future. People have talked about the climate crisis being the next great thing we have to face after COVID. So that's also on the agenda as well. And how obviously the industries that you're serving can play a big part in addressing that. So very exciting times, it sounds, uh, Mike. And plenty to sort of keep an eye on at GQA qualifications over the next few months and indeed years. Yeah, they, they, it's, uh, it is, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to keep it, keep track of everything that's going on, all, all the different bits and bobs of it. But it's, uh, yeah, it's the got a dedicated board who also get involved, um, help, advise, and, and, and so on. So it's, they were quite well connected as well. So it's, yeah, we, uh, we were quite confident of the, of the future. And we're going to continue to make some investments in, in schemes that will support and promote. Uh, the initials we're working. So, yeah, it's, I think it's a brand, the big green Q, you know, sort of brand uh, logo, if you like. Uh, I think that'll become more visible as the years go forward. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, certainly, to keep an eye on that. Um, it's regretful, uh, Mike, that we are just about out of time on the programme today because I could literally sort of sit and discuss this with you all day, but I would love the opportunity once we sort of see how some of these plans are coming along to so sort of welcome you back onto the show and just catch up on how things are progressing because it's a fantastic mission that you're on and it's going to be interesting to sort of keep an eye on those um, aspects going forward. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to come back at some point and give you an update. Um, that'd be great. It would be amazing. It's been 20 years, of course, of GQA qualifications officially and hopefully plenty more years to come in the future. Um, but Mike, do uh, take care and stay safe. And thanks again for joining us on the uh, the programme. And I'll look forward to hopefully touching base with you again very soon. You too. Thanks very much, Scott. And to all of our regular listeners tuning in today, I really do hope that you enjoyed the interview with Mike Morris from GQA Qualifications today and hearing about um, a fantastic 20-year history and hopefully much longer to come as well. Um, and also, if you feel that you have, having listened to this, your own story of success and innovation to share with us here at the Leaders' Council, then why don't you also apply to be on the show via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply because we'd absolutely love to hear from you. Um, until that next time, when we're back with a whole new story, Uh, Do take care and goodbye and we will see you all very soon.